In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy his consolations, through Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John. The Jews were complaining to each other about Jesus because he had said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Surely this is Jesus, son of Joseph, they said. We know his father and mother. How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus said in reply, Stop complaining to each other. No one can come to me unless he is drawn by the Father who sent me, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, They will all be taught by God, and to hear the teaching of the Father and learn from it is to come to me. Not that anybody has seen the Father except the one who comes from God. He has seen the Father. I tell you most solemnly, everybody who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the desert and they are dead. But this is the bread that comes down from heaven so that a man may eat it and not die. I am the living bread which has come down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh for the life of the world. We follow on from what Sister Karina explained last week. So you, 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 you must be very familiar with the context of this gospel. But just... As a recap, we're in Capernaum, so we've crossed the sea there and back. We've had the multiplication of the loaves on the other side. Jesus is now back on the other side. They they ask him, you know, how did you get there? And Jesus says to them, you know, you follow me because you've had bread. Um, and so it's still shortly before the Passover. So all this discourse is in the context of the Paschal offering of Jesus, who who is, remember that the institution of the Eucharist takes place uh, during the Passover meal. And here the discourse of the bread of life takes place shortly before the Passover. So this is the context, the offering of the lamb, the one who offers himself. Uh, This is very important because the, the concept of, you know, Jesus's bread of life who reveals himself to be the bread of life, is inseparable from the Paschal mystery. These two sort of elements are indissociable. They're inseparable. The the, the Eucharist is the Paschal sacrifice. So it's one and the same reality which is offered to us in a way that we can take it. So the Passover is the context for the bread of life. And Jesus teaches the people who question him. It begins with a complaint uh, from from the Jews here who who are really called that way by John, but really that means the Pharisees, the people who know their religion, the people who have already pondered the scripture and can see, hang on, this man can't be who he says he is because we know his father and mother. We know all about him and the one we're expecting we won't know. And and this is exactly what we have later on in John 7, where we have questions again about the identity of Jesus. Now, the question about the identity of Jesus, who Jesus is, is one of the themes that crosses over the whole of the Gospel of St. John. And every time Jesus reveals more and more of his identity, it's in the Gospel of St. John that we have all the I am sayings, of which I am the bread of life is one of them. But in John 7, we have again 
this same questioning. Who is this man? Who is this man? How can he talk like that? So uh, John 7, 26 to 29, some of the people of Jerusalem therefore said, is not this the man whom they seek to kill? And here he is speaking openly and they say nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? Yet we know where this man comes from. And when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. So there is something about the identity of Jesus. And basically the whole Gospel of John could be read in the, the lens of Jesus revealing his identity and his identity not being accepted at all by the people to whom he's trying to explain who he is. And in fact, it, it begins with the revelation of, of the word. In the beginning was the word. This is the identity of, of Christ and, and the word being rejected. So we have again and again, so in, in John 1, the word of God, and then the Lamb of God through the mouth of John the Baptist, now the bread of life, and all these identities are being rejected one after the other until he is led to the cross. So the Jews are really, it's not derogatory in any way, but it's to, to tell us these are the learned people, these are the people who know their religion, are faithful to their religion, and in a way it's us as well. Uh, who who have particular ideas about God and how God should behave, what God should do, and what kind of God we expect to have. And here Jesus completely breaks down every expectation, any anticipation, any presupposition about God. So this is the discourse of the bread of life, especially, is one of the most shocking discourses that Jesus gives and it's it should be as shocking to us that it was then to the people who listened to him because what sort of a human person says I am the bread of life I am the bread of life so in, in C.S. Lewis argument is that this 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 is incomprehensible this man is either mad or bad trying to deceive us or he's God there's no middle way there's no other way that this discourse could be taken but here is the point that when we put our faith in him when we start taking his word seriously and accepting what he says of himself and accepting the gift that he gives to us this is the way to eternal life. This is what he tells us. So now he gives everything and it's up to us to respond. And here is the, the whole movement of the gospel for tonight, if you want. This offer, very plainly spoken, uh, which is for our consideration and which hangs there waiting for our response. But... In the gospel, we begin, actually, with a response already given. Again, on the, on the back of those presupposition and those anticipation of who God is and what he should be doing according to our standards. And it begins with complaints. We begin with the people complaining. The Jews were complaining to each other about Jesus because he had said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And then they bring out what they know. And on the basis of what they know, they refuse what is being told to them. We know his father and mother. How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? And this complaining is the context for this passage tonight, which is a, a chunk of the, of the discourse uh, of the bread of life. And this complaining is something we, we can be very familiar with. We're familiar with it from the scripture themselves because complaining is one of the major issues, the major problem, the major obstacles that we meet in the desert during the exodus, during the wandering in the desert of the people of Israel. They start complaining practically the moment they set off. The first time they complain, well, and they have always very, very good reason to complain. They're in a desert, they're pursued by Pharaoh, there's a sea in front of them. You know, you have let us here to die. 
Because in human reckoning, their situation is literally impossible. And then they're being saved by crossing the Red Sea. And the moment they step ashore, they start complaining because they have no food, they have no drink. And so the whole of the Pentateuch is taken quite significantly with some of the biggest complaints, the murmuring. And it's the same word, murmuring. It's, it's the word that actually is used in Greek by John. And it's in Hebrew, this same word, murmuring, in Exodus. The whole congregation of the people of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness and said to them, would that we have died in the hand of the Lord. And so you see the parallel between the murmuring of the Jews with Jesus here in Capernaum and the murmuring in the desert because it's the same context of being fed by God. They have just been fed miraculously by Jesus, but they complain. Here they, they complain before being fed, but they, they, you know, this same attitude of, huh, at this point there is nothing God can do for us, or whatever this man says is unacceptable, so we will refuse. The response is already given before the gift is even considered. And, and this is an attitude we find in ourselves a lot. Uh, I find that attitude in myself a lot. That I know better. And I expect God to give me what I need according to my standards on my terms. And really, the Lord keeps sending us all sorts of signs, really, in the context of the John's Gospel. We can consider them as that in our life to stretch our mind and hearts to open us to accepting salvation, his salvation, his gift of eternal life, his gift of love, not on our terms, but on his terms. And for us, it's a very, very difficult stretch. It's something we find almost impossible because it would be a lot better for us to be in a transactional relationship with God where God does his bit and we do our bit and everybody is happy and as long as we keep you know, our, our boundaries, as it were, within that context, it's fine. But here is something radically different, because it's not transactional, because Jesus is not asking of them anything, actually, in the gospel, or rather is asking of them only one thing, and it's to believe. But what is he telling them? I am the bread of life. Uh, he's telling them to eat his flesh. And that's not transactional, that is radical, and that's unacceptable, as we will see at the end of the gospel. So it's salvation on God's term, and this is what we can't cope with. First of all, the first complaint is, this is not the man we want. We know his father and mother, so he can't be the man we're expecting. He can't be the Messiah. We know exactly what the Messiah should look like, and this guy is not it. So... We complain. The second complaint is it's not the bread we want. And we've seen that really what they're looking for from the previous chunk in the gospel is physical bread. It's the bread that feeds you for a minute and keeps you going for a day uh, and of which you have to, you know, get more. It's physical food. And we saw that in John 6.25, to 40 when Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. You get what you want. You get what you want on your own terms, in your own horizon, because for you, the most important thing is to fill your belly, is to have your comfort, is to have the things that you think are important. And you're not actually interested in the signs that I give you to stretch you to open your desire to what, to what I consider is important, which is your eternal life, which you don't really think of at all at this point because you're only thinking of your belly. So the bread that they want is, is the bread that they know, which is paradoxical really when you remember that in the desert they started complaining in Exodus that they had no food, and it's because they complained that they had no food that Moses went to the Lord and the Lord provided manna from heaven. 
they failed to trust that the Lord would provide in the wilderness. Um, but then when they had the manna, they started complaining about the manna. In Numbers 11, 1 to 5, they have enough. And the people complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some outlying parts of the camp. So that's the first complaining about their misfortune. What was their misfortune? Now the rabble that was among them had a strong craving and the people of Israel also wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt for nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. So they're given food miraculously and they complain about the miraculous food that they're given because it's not the food they want. It's, they're fed up with it. And to some extent, fair enough, they have 40 years of the manna. But it's still miraculous. Every day it's a, it's a new miracle. And they take it for granted and they get bored with it. Now again, there is a vast parallel with us when we forget the miraculous nature, the supernatural nature of the food that we are given daily by the Lord, we take it for granted. And sometimes we complain because it, it looks like nothing, doesn't it? And that manna would have looked like nothing, would have tasted that nothing. And yet it's the food that the Lord provides to keep his people alive. Now, there is a great paradox because on one hand they complained about the manna, but on the other hand in Exodus 16, they keep the manna because they are aware that it is miraculous. They are aware it is a pure gift from God that they haven't deserved. And so Moses commands uh, that some of the manna be kept. So Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. And in fact, in the Ark of the Covenant that was carried in the desert and then placed in the temple, the temple of David, within the Ark was kept not only the tables of the law, but this manna, some of the manna that was kept in this jar, according to what Moses said in, in Exodus 16, 31 to 35, to be kept kept by the people of Israel to remember that the Lord had fed them with bread from heaven on their journey in the wilderness and as well was kept the rod of Aaron. Now Jesus is offering a new manna, a, a different bread, a bread that is eaten and gives eternal life. Your fathers ate manna in the desert and they are dead but this is the bread that comes down from heaven so that a man may eat it and not die. And they complain. This is not the bread they want. And so, not the bread. Not the man we want, not the bread we want. It's not, nor is it the faith we want. Because Jesus is asking them to believe in him. And this is really the, the one response that is asked I am the bread of life. I give you eternal life. You have my flesh to eat. I am here for you. I am given over to you as food. The fundamental response is not, is not again, a, an earning of that food. is not a transactional response. It's simply believing those words, accepting those words, trusting those words. And that response will not be given, as we see at the end of the gospel, many of his disciples leave him because they can't take it. Because this is too much to believe. It is too scandalous. It's too radical. Um, but here, this is what Jesus is asked, uh, is asking them. I tell you solemnly, everybody who believes has eternal life. Simply to accept those words, to accept what he says and this even is very difficult it's beyond human power alone because it requires the gift of the father 
It requires the gift of the Father. No one can come to me unless he's drawn by the Father who sent me. So even that faith to believe. And this is a great reassurance for us when we are at Mass and we are presented with the Lamb of God under the form of bread and wine. Behold the Lamb of God. When we believe those words and we recognize and we acknowledge the Lamb of God, we acknowledge that this is Jesus Christ, dead and risen, present among us, substantially present, in, under the form of bread and wine. That faith that we have at that moment is a gift from God, is a gift from the Father. So we can be reassured um, that, you know, the... the the life of God is in us, is allowing us to respond to the gift of God. So even our response is a gift from God, but it is it involves our freedom. It involves our, our ascent. And what Jesus is asking of us is not to understand fully, because I don't think anyone can. And it is absolutely all right to question and to say, I don't know. I don't understand how this is possible. But here the complaining is not about not understanding. It's about not wanting. I don't want this man. I don't accept that man to be who he is, who he says he is, because I know better. I don't accept those words because they don't, they, they are repulsive to me. I will not eat the flesh of that man. I, you know, there is a not wanting. And that is really the heart of of the matter it's not so much not understanding it's not wanting that's a that's what the complaints are about it's not the faith we want we would be a lot happier with a god who keeps safe distance from us requires of us some perhaps some sacrifice but gives us what we actually expect you know wealth and health and and sort of peace and a good life, but a God who gives himself to eat without providing necessarily those things that we actually do want is a bit much. Because the kind of intimacy he wants to have with us is not the kind of intimacy we are prepared to have with him, unfortunately. Because his love is infinite and that actually can put us off. We're not used to this kind of love. And that's what I'm going to talk uh, later on about. But it's not the life we want, that eternal life. We want just a cushy life, a life of an everyday life, a life where we have the bread to fill our belly and no other bread because that's quite enough. Thank you very much. And so it turns out to be not the God we want. Not the man we want is not the God we want because Jesus Christ in his person, is both fully God and fully man. And the kind of God he reveals, he reveals through his humanity. And so, this is not the God we want. In the you know, When the Jews complain, this is not the salvation we want. This is not the sort of thing we expect God to do or want him to do. Because here God in Christ reveals himself to be sort of mad with love. A madness that is actually scary for us. Because who gives himself to eat out of love? Who does that? No human person would do that. And yet this is what God does in his humanity, in Jesus, for us. He wants the kind of intimacy with us that is signified by us receiving him in our bodies so that we are in him and he is in us. That's the kind of intimacy he wants with us, to be literally one with us as food for our body and our soul. As the one who gives us life as it were, from inside. That's a kind of intimacy that is radical, extreme. And, of course, it, it's not transactional. 
but it demands a reciprocity. It demands a response for us. And if it's not the kind of intimacy we are ready to have with God, then we have a problem. Because we won't get anything else from God but himself. We'd rather have things from God than him, because his love is all burning and all encompassing and all infinite, and this is not something we cope with very easily. Because it's salvation given on his terms. And his salvation is not just for us to have a, a lovely place somewhere under the sun and be free of worry and have the full comfort. The salvation that he offers is his own life. Eternal life is the life of the Father and the Son. And in that gospel, we start from the Father and the Son. It's funny because the, the Jews complain and they they mention the the foster father, the earthly father, the father that everybody knows, Jesus, the son of Joseph. We know his father and mother. And Jesus keeps talking about his father, and he has talked about his father before. No one can come to me unless he's drawn by the father who sent me. So Jesus is, is leading them to another kind of relation, and he's putting the starting point of every one of his discourse, really, in St. John, in his own relationship with the father. The Father and the Son, that's how Jesus reveals God who, to be, the Father and the Son. And everything Jesus says and everything Jesus does, especially in the Gospel of St. John, is to reveal that relationship to the world, the Father and the Son's own relationship, a divine relationship into which we would have no insight if God himself in Jesus had not revealed it. And not only to reveal it as something, as the ultimate truth of everything that is, that God is Father and Son and Holy Spirit, but that there's a God who is a personal relationship. And to open that relationship to us. Again, it's, it's a radical gift. It's extreme. And, you know... We tend to, in our physical, material anxieties and, and in our narrowness of heart and mind, we tend to have a, a lot lower expectations for ourselves. We look forward to the weekend. We look forward to having a good time. We don't necessarily look to having a burning relationship of, of love with the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. But this is what God offers us. And it doesn't mean we won't have a good time. It means, in fact, we'll have a better time than anything we can imagine. But because it's beyond the sort of the limitations of our little love, it looks very, very scary to us. Uh, the, and, and especially when it's offered to us by Jesus through eating him, the bread of life. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh for the life of the world. That's extreme. Is that really what we want? Is that the kind of relationship with God we want? Something so intimate that we have no boundaries for ourselves, that we have no, as it were, freedom to get out and to call our terms and to stand on our rights because God has given us everything that he is in Jesus in, in the most intimate act of eating um, of being one with him through consuming him and being consumed by him so this stretching you know God's stretches himself out as it were in Jesus the word becomes flesh and the flesh becomes food and it stretches us back to accept him him as he is salvation on his own terms and it's sometimes you know because that doesn't guarantee a, a wonderful life free of cares and full of comfort it guarantees a life filled with God that's all it is uh, the rest of the circumstances of our life uh, we'll take on the shape of the cross in whatever way that comes. That's the salvation 
that God gives us. It's himself. It's his own life. And so this whole movement of love, God stretching himself out in the Son and the Holy Spirit to give us himself is one that requires the gift of ourselves in, in, in response. And, and the word that is, you know, uh, spoken by the Father, they will all be taught by God. And to hear the teaching of the Father and learn from it, it is to come to me. Why? Because he's the word. He's the word of the Father and the word becomes our food. And you see in this, even in this tiny passage of the uh, bread of life, we have the structure of the mass again because we have the teaching, the word of God sent by the Father, received in faith. And that's our liturgy of the word. Who becomes flesh, who becomes bread for us so that the word nourishes body and soul. It nourishes the, the, the whole of our being because what God wants, and again, this is salvation on God's term, is not just some part of us. Just as he gives the whole of himself in Jesus, he wants the whole of ourselves. Body and soul, mind and heart, everything that is ours, he, he desires just as he gives everything that is his. Mass is something really radical. What we celebrate on Sunday is very, very extreme. And that's probably why the first Christians were hounded as cannibals. Uh, because it was so, it is so literal. It is so literal. And it's not a matter of option. Jesus doesn't say, if you want, if you want more love, you can have me as food. Uh, if you'd rather not, that's okay too. No, the words of Jesus are, are very difficult to hear. This is the way that he gives us eternal life. I am the living bread which has come down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. So that's the bread that gives life. We don't know of any other bread that gives that kind of life. And so the Eucharist is not just a matter of life uh, sort of um, life option of, of lifestyle. It's a matter of life and death. It's a matter of receiving eternal life in the way that God gives it to us, chooses to give it to us. And of course, we'd rather choose some other way uh, because it's, it's both too great and too small for us because the humility of God in the Eucharist, the humbleness of that tiny little piece of nothing of this little wafer that looks like a wafer that's not a wafer but that's Jesus it doesn't look like God it doesn't look like God at all and it's actually scandalous and that's why in our liturgy we try to put our faith invisibility as it were everything about the liturgy is a language to speak of the reality of what's happening because in and of itself the bread and the wine that are transformed into the body and blood of Christ still look like bread and wine and without all the liturgical celebration we could easily forget and in fact we do forget and this is the tragic aspect of it that God is so great and humble at the same time fully man fully God unrecognizable as God among men and this is where the Jews complain is this, this we know his father and mother unrecognizable as God among bread uh, because an unconsecrated host looks just like a consecrated one and that's the humility of God who comes to be with us where we are as we are with the food that we have. And that is as unacceptable to us as the radical love that gives everything that he is. That he, he gives everything, everything that he is in one single host. The whole fullness of God because God is indivisible. And that's why we, we are very careful to consume every particle of the Eucharist, not to let any drop to the floor be lost, because every single tiny piece 
of the Eucharist is Jesus, whole and entire, who gives himself. Jesus doesn't parcel himself out. He cannot divide himself. So it's the whole of him. And again, this is something unacceptable in many, many ways at many different levels for us. But this is salvation on God's terms. This is how uh, infinite God's love is. And this infinity of God's love is manifested, manifested concretely in the Eucharist. So what does it mean for us? For us, it means that just as God comes to us in this utter humility, as man among men, as bread among bread, it requires of us the same humility to just accept what he says. And that's very difficult, to just take it and accept it on his terms and on the terms of the church. Because we're not, we, none of us, on our own, has the authority to decide how and when and under what circumstances God should give himself to us. He is the one who decides, he is the one, and he has established his church so that he can be given to humanity on his terms. Um, so for us, it's this call to receive, to accept the gift of God, and this is hard enough. It, it, you would think it's quite easy to just be there to receive. And, and in fact, this is what Mass is about. We just turn up and, and receive the gift of the, of the Father, which is the Son, in the Holy Spirit. That's a summary of the Mass. The Father gives his Son. In fact, the whole Mass is the prayer of the Son to the Father in which we are caught. And then the Father gives the Son to us in the Holy Spirit so that we are filled with the Trinitarian life, uh, which is the life of communion. The Holy Trinity is a communion of person into which we are inv invited through Holy Communion. So we are called to receive, called to eat, take and eat. This is my body. Called to believe, behold the Lamb of God, the body of Christ, when we hear those words we, and we say, Amen, this is an act of faith primarily to, to receive Holy Communion. We're called to obedience. Again, on our terms, salvation is not given. It's given on God's terms. We are called to obey the way in which God has decided to give himself, even when we find it too much, uh, to take in and it's always going to be too much because <laughs> there is no comparison there is no point at which all the all the human aspects of the liturgy that we participate in and and, and sort of try to to, to um, sort of humanly arrange will match the greatness of the gift that is given during the liturgy so we're just called to receive and know that whatever we give God will be minuscule in, in comparison with what he gives us. But that's the way he wants it to be. So there's no room for pride. We are called to trust those words of his. Again, this, this John 6, when at the end, the people go away because they can't take it. It shows us, it reminds us that trust is really a decision. It's not a feeling. Right, these are the words of Jesus. What am I going to do? Am I going to trust him? Or am I going to distrust him? And this is a question for all of us, for the human person who is confronted with God's revelation in Christ, every single one of us, believers or not. To some extent, there's a point at which those words are mad. Am I going to trust those words? Or am I going to distrust them? And it's a call to salvation. This is, we cannot save ourselves. And here the, the death of our dear sister Margarita is a reminder for us sisters that, you know, this is, this is the common lot. And here is a life she had lived 62 years of, of religious profession of complete fidelity to God 
because and and she trusted she she staked all her life on those words the on the word of god trusting to receive salvation from him as he had promised again this promise of religious life which she lived for 62 years is only a response to the promise of god of salvation and and we you know a witness to us uh, of a life lived in in faith hope and charity and nothing else basically that's basically the religious life so so this is what is promised to us and we only have the words to trust and believe are we ready to do that and in some way every mass for us is an act of trust is an act of faith of saying yes i believe those words i want to live by those words i want to receive i have nothing of myself i have nothing i am utterly poor and I want to come and receive everything from God. And that is himself. That is what Mass is. And that defines, if you want, the, the whole nature of the church. Not just of the individual vocation, but of the whole church who is, as a body, as a community, as an assembly, as a communion, taught by God. That's the word, again, the liturgy of the word. Drawn by the Father, because the faith of the church is the gift of the Father. Um, fed by the Son and is formed into the new Israel. If you want, again, here the, the, the parallel between John's Gospel and the Exodus narrative with the wilderness and the complaint fits perfectly because we are in the wilderness and we are given this manna and we are formed by the manna that is the bread from heaven Jesus Christ himself, the living bread, we are formed into this new Israel, the new covenant, uh, the people who have been rescued not from Pharaoh uh, and the slavery of Egypt, but from the slavery of sin and death. And we live on the way, we are on the way to receive the eternal life which is, which is promised and guaranteed by the living bread of the risen Christ. So that, if you want, is, is, is um, a summary of, of the whole Christian journey of being in that wilderness, being receiving the word of God, trusting those words, and to stop complaining that things are not the way we want, but knowing that God is doing everything according to the way he wants, and that whatever is allowed by him to happen to us ultimately is for us to grow in trust in faith in love of him relying on nothing else but him and being fed more and more being consumed more and more by 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 the eucharist by the living bread who offers himself to us in total poverty uh, to to feed and to rescue and to save our own poverty, uh, to for us to receive a, a life that of ourselves we could never have claimed.